Innocent until proven guilty. Those are the four words that shape the very bedrock of what we know today as Western law and order. Sadly, nowadays, people will only settle for the alternative, which is guilty until proven innocent, thinking that justice will be served under their own accord. But instead of getting justice, it leaves behind a path of wanton absolute destruction. And here on this episode, we're going to be talking about one of the earliest cases of guilty until proven innocent in early American history. The Salem Witch Trials. To fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. Hey everybody, this is Atticus the Death Metaler, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Death Metal Historian. Happy Halloween to all of y'all ghouls, ghosties, slashers, zombies, and big titty ethot girls with their premium Snapchats going around this quarantine year. And for this episode, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite moments in early American history, the Salem Witch Trials. What, what, what the fuck? Who's, who's calling me? Hello? Hey, Addy, what you doing? Oh, oh, Shades, uh, I wasn't expecting you to call me. Um, I'm, I'm doing a premiere right now on my channel. Really? Like, right now? Yes. Right now. It's on the Salem Witch Trials. You mean to tell me that you were talking about something that's a big part of the history of my state and didn't think to tell me? Oh, oh, oh shit, dude. I am so sorry, man. I didn't mean for that. I meant to have you be part of this, this fucking episode, but, you know, shit happens with the whole quarantine stuff and everything else going around and uh, selling money to uh, my favorite e-thoughts. So you're simping now. Wait, what? Um, no, no, you didn't, you didn't hear that. You heard me saying uh, my, my favorite um, e- Yes, yes, you're right. So can I be a part of this? Only if you do not tell anyone. Well, you did say you were premiering right now, so I don't think there's anything I can do about that. <laughs> Also, I'm wearing my Foo Fighters shirt in this because by the time this video ends, we will all need Jesus. Yeah, you're kind of right. Let's get this over with now, shall we? Witchcraft has been around probably since the very start of human civilization. The very moment in where humans began having spiritual beliefs, human tribes would begin seeking guidances to such spiritual advisors called shamans, or witches. People who believe that spells and charms would improve fertility, crops, fight sickness, show the future, or in some extreme cases, punish thine enemies. But for the sake of this video, we will talk about European witchcraft. Around in Celtic, Slavic, and Greco-Roman societies, people sought guidance from a spiritual shaman or priest slash oracle. Everything was all fine and dandy around paganistic views until the year 313 AD. Emperor Constantine establishes a new religion upon the Roman Empire. Christianity. And oh boy, did it change everything. Not only were the Christians finally no longer a very secretive and oppressed cult, they were all free range heavily encouraged to actually turn the cheek on the very pagans that had fed them to the lions. Even as the Western Roman Empire finally fell, plunging Western Europe to the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church established itself as the very sole true authority of the land. And when I mean the sole true authority, I mean the true authority of the land. Basically everything they saw as blasphemous, mathematics, science, philosophy, anything pertaining to the classical era that would have actually benefited society for centuries to come, was destroyed and forgotten, seen as blasphemous pagan teachings from their pagan oppressors. They even twist the very pagan myths themselves. For instance, the Greek god Pan, or a faun, was twisted in a way by Christians themselves as their view of the prince of darkness, Satan. 
or Lucifer, who would send witches as his servants in favor for sexual gratification. Starting in the 1490s, churches and local theocratic governments across all of Europe began a campaign to basically snuff out and destroy all revenants of paganism throughout Europe. Many of you know this as the Inquisition. But I think the most brutal Inquisition all of you would know would be that of the Spanish Inquisition led by Tomas de Torquemada. Over the next 150 years, an estimates of over 50,000 people or even more are arrested, tried, and executed for heresy slash witchcraft, either by being burned at the stake or a quick drop in the sun stop. Largely, this was all influenced by a book called the Malleus Maleficarum written by a German Dominican monk by the name of Heinrich Kramer. The Maleficarum was a manual on how to find and snuff out witches. These barbaric atrocities would go on until the 17th century. Witch hunting during this time are waning down and new ideas are flowing out through Europe, secular governments, and even science making a comeback. It is a time where a lot of things are changing and ideas that were once thought blasphemous and evil are now being rediscovered in Europe. And not everyone obviously are not buying into it. Especially a sect of very highly conservative Christians known as the Puritans. Oh boy, if you thought that some of the Bible thumpers in today's America were bad, the Puritans would give them a run for their money. Puritans believed that the only way for them to reach the kingdom of God was through hard work and prayer. Basically, doing anything fun was bad, and being a miserable fuck was good. Wow. <laughs> Just fucking wow. Seeing all this stuff going on in England did not vibe with the Puritans that well. But they realized that there was an alternative in order to practice their miserable existence away from England. Opportunities in the New World. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was founded by the Puritans in 1628. They called it their Shining City on a Hill, a colony where they would practice their very strict way of life. There were three major areas in the colony. Boston, Charlestown, and of course, Salem. Salem was founded in 1626 and would become one of the most significant seaports in American history. Sadly, during this time period, Salem was a fairly small and unhappy place. Undergoing a period of turmoil with little political guidance, there was a social divide between the leading families as well as a split between factions that were for and against the village's new pastor, Samuel Paris. Paris, being a former businessman, was aware of the village conflicts that had taken place in the last several years. His Puritan beliefs dictating that each person was responsible for monitoring his neighbor's piety led him to feel that conflict was inevitable. On June 18, 1689, at a general meeting of all the villagers, it was agreed that Samuel Paris would be hired at an annual salary of 66 pounds, and the villagers would provide firewood for both the church and parsonage. At a later meeting, the villagers agreed they would also provide Paris and his heirs, the village parsonage, a barn, and two acres of land. Paris accepted the position, and he and his family immediately moved to Salem Village, settling into the parsonage and beginning his ministerial duties that same month. Reverend Paris brought his his wife, Elizabeth, his nine-year-old daughter, Betty, his 11-year-old niece, Abigail Williams, and his slaves, Tatuba and John Indian, to the parsonage. On November 19, 1689, the Salem Village Church Charter was finally signed, and the Reverend Salem Paris became the Salem Village's first ordained minister. His ministry began smoothly, but as Paris began to reveal his beliefs and traits, a number of Salem villagers, including a few church members, did not like what they saw. By the fall of 1691, only two years after his ordination, Paris's ritual orthodoxy, overbearing disposition, and the disputed contract had caused the village and the church to once again break into factions. Church attendance fell, and village officials refused to provide firewood to warm the church or Paris's house. Matters turned worse when a new committee of five was chosen by the village in October 1691, which announced its refusal to relinquish the ministry house and land to Paris, or to collect taxes for his salary, leaving it to the villagers to pay by quote-unquote voluntary contributions. Paris then called upon church members to make a formal complaint to the county church against the committee's neglect of the church. The factional fighting also began to play out in his weekly sermons as a battle between God and Satan. Tensions were boiling. The small village was about to descend to chaos, and the breaking point was drawing near. In the very winter of 1691, Paris's daughter Elizabeth and Paris's niece, Abigail Williams, began to undertake experiments in fortune telling, mostly focusing on their future social status and potential husbands. They were quick to share their game with other young girls in the area, even though the practice of fortune telling was regarded as demonic activity. By January 1692, nine-year-old Betty appeared to be consumed with a secret preoccupation and was forgetting errands and unable to concentrate. She then began to act in strange ways, 
barking like a dog when her father would rebuke her, screaming wildly when she heard the Our Father prayer and once hurled a Bible across the room. After these episodes, she sobbed distractedly and spoke of being damned, perhaps because of her practice of fortune telling. The Reverend Samuel Paris believed that prayer could cure her odd behavior, but his efforts were ineffective in vain. In fact, her actions got <coughs> Surprisingly worse. She was contorting her body into odd postures, consistently spouting foolish and ridiculous speeches, and generally having fits. The Reverend Paris consulted with other ministers who would not explain her action, but when he brought out the local doctor, William Griggs, he suggested that her malady must be the result of witchcraft. Now, back in those days, if they could not figure out what the problem was, they would mostly think that the culprit was that of witchcraft. Cause again, white people back then were superstitious as hell. Modern technology suggests that they may have been caused by some combination of stress, asthma, guilt, boredom, child abuse, epilepsy, and delusional psychosis. Another theory was first presented in 1976 in an article in the Science Magazine where Dr. Linda R. Corporal argued that a disease called convulsive ergotism might have been to blame. The disease is brought in by ingesting rye grain infected with ergot, a fungus that can invade developing kernels of rye grain, especially under warm and damp conditions. But turns out that those claims are always debunked, yet people always still bring out the theory of the ergot fungus. Also fun fact, ergot was how we got LSD. So now you know. Paris then organized prayer meetings and days of fasting in an attempt to alleviate Betty's symptoms, but the frenzy just spread. Soon, Betty's cousin, at Abigail Williams, was also having fits, followed by some of their friends, including Ann Putnam Jr. and Mary Walcott. Since the sufferers of witchcraft were believed to be the victims of a crime, the community set out to find the perpetrators. On February 29, 1692, under intense adult questioning, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams named Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba as their tormentors. Tituba was the first person to be accused by Elizabeth Paris and Abigail Williams of witchcraft. It has been theorized that Tituba told the girls tales of voodoo and witchcraft prior to the accusations. She was also the first to confess to witchcraft in March 1692. Initially denying her involvement in witchcraft, Tituba later confessed to making a witch cake due to being beaten by Samuel Paris with the intention of getting a confession. Now, a witch cake was a cake made from rye and urine from the afflicted girls. After it was baked, it was later fed to a dog who would consume the cake and then walk over to anyone who was a suspected evildoer. The information was passed over to Samuel Paris, who, upon hearing this information, was furious at Tituba. Caved under the pressure of the town and her master, Tituba cracked and spun a crazy elaborate tale involving demonic animals, people flying on broomsticks in the night, and a dark man with a book containing the names of suspected witches in the village, and she name-dropped four people. Goody Osborne, Sarah Good, an unknown woman, and a tall man. Tituba was put into custody with the two accused women, Sarah Good and Goody Osborne, but the trials were just getting started. As the trials began, the court of Oyer and Terminier convened in Salem Town under June 2nd, 1692, with William Salton, the new lieutenant governor, as chief magistrate, Tom Newton as the Crown's attorney prosecuting the cases, and Stephen Sewall as clerk. Back in this time period, Western law as we know it was not around, and with a community that was very superstitious, as well as very religious. So the courts had no evidence except for the accusations that everyone around Salem was flinging at each other. So they had to rely on something called spectral evidence. Spectral evidence is a form of evidence based upon dreams and visions which was admitted by the courts by William Sauton. Spectral evidence was a testimony that the accused witch's spirit appeared to be the witness of a dream or vision. For example, like a black cat or a wolf in their dreams. The dream or vision was admitted as evidence, thus witness who were often the accusers would testify that Goody Proctor bit, pinched, and almost choked me, and I liked it, sort of thing. Don't kink shame me, Damien! Respected Minister Cotton Mather wrote a letter imploring that the court not to allow spectral evidence testimony about dreams and vision. Increase Mother, and another minister, was quoted saying, It were better that ten suspected witches should escape than that one innocent person should be condemned. The court largely ignored these requests and proceeded with this practice, which actually did a lot more harm than it done good. 
trials took place from 1692 to May 1693. Over 200 people were accused of being witches and imprisoned for months on end. The jail back in those days was very uncomfortable where the summers were sweltering hot and the winters freezing cold. The colonists in Salem did not have a lot of options when they were accused. The accused were not represented by lawyers, but were allowed to directly ask accusers and witnesses questions. This often did not work out in the accused person's favor because they were often not educated enough or emotionally equipped enough to defend themselves against the accusation of witchcraft. Many times, once a person was accused, scores of witnesses, particularly the afflicted girls, came out against them and provided this type of damning testimony. As a result, the accused often weighed their options by waiting and watching what happened to others accused before them. This made it quite difficult for some of the first people accused in the trials because they didn't have any type of guidance. The accused witches quickly figured out by observing the early trials that a confession could spare you from the gallows. The problem was that a confession may spare them death, but it damned them in many other ways. The biggest concern with confessing to being a witch was that it was a sin. Puritans believed that such a confession, even if it wasn't true, could damn a person's soul to hell. Being a colonist in Salem during the 1690s, you had to watch your back. You think the social media age we live in now is scary? Imagine how people back then felt. Those who did not bring a false confession to the courts in order to save their skins were all sent to the gallows. 25 people would fall victim to the hysteria. 19 were given a quick drop and a sudden stop. 5 died while imprisoned. And one man, Giles Corey, was killed by having boulders piled on all over his body. This was a form of torture called Atticus House is pronounced Piene Forte et Dure. Okay, Piene Forte et Dure, where if the accused did not bring out a plea, he would have heavy boulders placed on a plank of wood on his chest. Corey's last words were, more weight. Three days later, Martha Corey, Giles' wife, was hanged on September 22, 1692. And if that wasn't crazy enough, two dogs were given trial and then executed. Oops. One tavern owner by the name of John Proctor was openly vocal on how these trials were getting way out of hand. So out of hand that Proctor's third wife was accused of witchcraft. Sadly, Proctor too became victim of the accusations and on August 19, 1692, he was executed by hanging. After increased Mother's criticism on how far the trials went, it finally looked that there was an end at sight. Governor Phipps, in response to Mother's plea and his own wife being questioned for witchcraft, prohibited further arrests, released many accused witches, and dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminare on October 29th. Phipps replaced it with the Superior Court of Judicature, which disallowed spectral evidence and only condemned three out of 56 defendants. Phipps eventually pardoned all who were in prison of witchcraft, charges by May 1693, but the damage had been done. Following the trials and executions, many involved like Judge Samuel Sewell publicly confessed error and guilt. On January 14, 1697, the general court ordered a day of fasting and soul searching for the tragedy of Salem. In 1702, the court declared the trials unlawful, and in 1711, the colony passed a bill restoring the rights and good names of those accused and granted 600 pounds restitution to their heirs. However, it was not until 1957, more than 250 years later, that Massachusetts formally apologized for the events of 1692. The Salem Witch Trials is considered by many Americans to be one of the most darkest chapters in early American history. Yet, many people are fascinated by the event, and that has become a part of American culture as we know it. In present-day Salem, it was confirmed by both historians and scholars that the site Proctor's Ledge, where the victims were hung, is located between Pope and Proctor Street. There's also a memorial where it names all the victims who died. And let's not forget all the gift shops and restaurants to all the tourists who flock to Salem daily. Now you would think that after an event like the trials at Salem, that Western law and order would be more advanced and improved after five and a half centuries, right? Actually, no. In the years 1950 and 1954, America had a new witch hunt in full swing, and they were not witches. They were... Commies. Commie! Commie! Yeah, go get them, Dwight. Whee! God damn it, indeed. Under the name of McCarthyism, named after Wisconsin Senator Joe McCarthy, McCarthyism was a vociferous campaign to rat out suspected communists, which thousands of Americans were blacklisted, sent to jail, fired, and their lives ruined. Around the same time McCarthyism was in full swing, playwright Arthur Miller wrote the famous play The Crucible, which is a fictional telling of the Salem Witch Trials. The play was first performed at the Martin Beck Theater on Broadway in 1953. Martin, too, was questioned by the House of Representatives since his play was an allegory of McCarthyism. 
A novel was also written by Elizabeth George Spear called The Witch of Blackbird Pond in 1958 that I remember both reading and seeing a stage adaptation of as a kid about a woman from Barbados named Kit being accused of being a witch. It seems that the guilty until innocent mentality will never go away in America, whether it's due to the witch trials, McCarthyism, satanic daycare centers, the Me Too movement, cancel culture. It is as American as apple pie. And just like the old saying goes, those who do not remember the past are doomed to forever repeat it. So what are your guys' thoughts and opinions on the Salem Witch Trials? Do you live in Salem, Massachusetts? Are your ancestors victims of the Salem Witch Trials? Do you think it's all bullshit? Do you think that those people deserve to be hanged? Are you like some crazy ass Puritan Christian ding dong duty hickey wicker walker that I don't know like leave it down in the comments below also before I end this video I want to give a big thank you and a shout out to my good friend Rancher and Shades for helping me out onto this video you're welcome gay also I have a discord server which it is down on the description below. I know I've been getting a lot of complaints about the link not working. So if you follow me on Instagram, I basically send in screenshots of how to get onto my Discord server. If you guys follow me on Instagram and want to be part of my Discord, that would be great. And once you get onto Discord, I also have a channel on my Discord server, which is on the Death Metal Historian, where we can talk about other, other topics and future ideas for the death metal historian. I'm trying to be like the bootleg version of Absolute Mad Lads, all right, people? So we gotta keep it coming. I wanna see some great ideas onto this series, and I really fucking love bringing out my love of history onto this YouTube channel for all of you guys. I, I absolutely love it. So without further ado, ladies and gents, I am Atticus the Death Metaler. Hope you liked this video. Subscribe to my channel. Links are down in the description below. Keep it metal, and please, guys, have a very happy and a very safe Halloween, y'all. Prost.